Nick McGerrison here. Welcome to Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading the podcast. If you're enjoying what you hear, do make sure you've subscribed. This week, we're presenting to you our Extreme Everest mini-series. And a special treat for you today. This is the plenary session. It's the Morpheus Consortium Distinguished Lecture. Extreme Everest, Mike Grocott's Physiology on Top of the World. Have a listen. Top Med Talk. Thank you very much, Tim. Another very kind, probably overkind introduction. Thank you very much. It's a real delight to be here. Thank you for those of you who have been with us all afternoon. Thank you very much for staying and joining in this evening. And I apologise if I end up recapitulating some of what you've heard this afternoon, but hopefully in a slightly different context. So my plan is really, I will mention the science because the whole expedition was wrapped up in the ambition to do science that would benefit patients. But I will principally try and tell the story of the expedition of why we went, of how we went, of what we did. Basically try and tell you the story of the whole Extreme Everest endeavour and touch upon the science only where it's it's relevant to that. And I've got a couple of video clips and I guess a couple of, if you like, sub-narratives that I'll try and weave through that. And one of them starts with this video clip, which is taken from the Horizon documentary. Installation of all stars in Eric. I can see one, two, three, four, five, six people on the triangular face of it. The rescue party dealing with a Nepali woman. Can we just revise that time estimate? The guys move really fast. We can see them just over the ice bolt. High on the mountain, a female Nepali climber, Usha Bista, has succumbed to the lack of oxygen. She has been found by another team, delirious and alone, at 8,500 meters. Someone's coming here, he speaks in... Someone who speaks... Very good Napoleon, very good English. Someone's coming as well. Yeah. Here was a person on their own, uh, getting into that situation where they get sick, no one with them to realize they're becoming unwell, becoming confused, and uh, the outcome of all that is that uh, she ends up unconscious at 8,500 meters. Not a great place to become unconscious with no one around you. Mike knows if they don't act immediately, this could be fatal. What did you drag her on? Stretcher or no stretcher? Does she know what day it is? You need to respond. She's in a tent. She's in tent. Where about? Summit. So I'll leave that there and we'll come back to Usha's story a little bit later on. But hers was one of the stories that became intertwined with ours as we tried to both climb the mountain and do the science. The image you can see in front of you now, this is Everest from the north side. So as you, I'm sure you know, Everest sits on the border between Tibet, now part of China, to the north and Nepal to the south. So this is looking from the Tibetan side. And this is the side of the mountain that was the only side that was approached for 20, 30 years before the war. And attempting to climb Everest was essentially an exclusively British game because the British were effectively the colonial power, although not in name, they were effectively the colonial power in Tibet. And during the 1920s and 1930s, there were a number of expeditions. I imagine some of you will have read of them or heard of them of incredibly brave. I mean, the the level of exploration in comparison to what happens now is extraordinary. Sadly, all gentlemen in their tweeds and multiple woven underwear attempting to get to the summit of Everest. And although they didn't succeed, they did, bec- they did come remarkably close. So both with and without supplemental oxygen, they came within just a few hundred metres of the summit of Everest during the 1920s and the 1930s. The Second World War came along, nothing happened during the late 30s and early 40s. And then just as people were starting to contemplate climbing Everest again... The Chinese invaded Tibet. Tibet became abruptly closed to any external visitors. And Nepal, which had previously been a very private country that had not particularly welcomed foreign visitors, and when they came had kept them just in the Kathmandu Valley, abruptly opened up prudently to allow visitors to visit the south side of the mountain. And these were the sort of views they got. And there was a reconnaissance expedition in 1951, swiftly followed by a Swiss attempt at climbing in the spring of 1952, where again, uh, two climbers got very, very close to the summit, but did not succeed. So Raymond Lambert, a well-known Swiss guide, and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay, so Sherpa Tenzing that we'll hear of later, got close to the top, and they probably didn't succeed because they hadn't appreciated the issues around dehydration, and they didn't have adequate facilities to melt water and therefore get liquid. And, And arguably one of the reasons that the British did ultimately succeed was their attention to the quite basic 
physiological principles, including hydration and the use of supplemental oxygen. So the Swiss came close, but failed in 1952. And in 1953, as you all know, on the eve of the coronation of our current queen, who is still around, which is just extraordinary, Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay succeeded in reaching the summit of Everest in late May. And finally, demonstrated that humans could reach the highest point on the surface of the Earth. Now, this is an image of Tenzing. I know that because there are no images of Hillary on the top. He, he couldn't actually... Uh, Tenzing was able, unable to use a camera at this time, so the only images are of Tenzing. And what you can see in this image is that he's using supplemental oxygen. So he's got a mask on, and both him and Hillary used a relatively rudimentary but still effective oxygen system that allowed them to go to the top. And Hillary did take his oxygen off for a few minutes, which he describes in his book, uh, and he felt pretty rubbish when he took his oxygen off. So he describes feeling pretty woozy and was left with the opinion that it would probably not be possible to climb Everest without supplemental oxygen. And that opinion was in accord with the views of most of the physicians and physiologists at the time. There were a few prescient individuals who even back in the 20s had done some careful physiology and thought it might be possible, but the majority view was that it would simply not be possible for humans to reach the summit of Everest without the use of additional oxygen. And it took just a few weeks shy of 25 years for that to be disproved or to be demonstrated that it was possible uh, when Reinhold Messner and uh, Peter Haberler, so two German-speaking Italians from the Tyrol, successfully climbed Everest from the south without using supplemental oxygen at all. And in doing so, they became the 64th and 65th individuals to climb Everest. And that sort of proportion remains true right up to this day. So only about 4% of all the individuals who climbed Everest have done so without using additional oxygen. And in the winter, when there's the barometric pressure, as it is everywhere, is just a little bit lower, only one individual has climbed Everest without using supplemental oxygen, and that person was a Sherpa, and we'll come back to this, but probably someone who's therefore genetically advantaged because of the very long duration of existence of that race at high altitude on the Tibetan Plateau. So this will be very familiar to you. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but to emphasize those key facts that the barometric pressure and therefore partial pressure, because of course the proportion of oxygen remains constant as the barometric pressure falls, so the partial pressure of oxygen falls. The barometric pressure is about half the sea level value at Everest Base Camp and about one third the sea level value at the summit of Everest. And so therefore the partial pressure is also about one half at Base Camp and one third at the summit. And those are useful figures to keep in mind as we think through some of the data. And if, if you abruptly expose someone to the sort of barometric pressure that we see at the summit of Everest, which most typically would come from your acute cabin decompression, the James Bond scenario where a gun goes off, the fuselage explodes, etc. So the cruising altitude of most commercial jets is somewhere around 30, 31, 32,000 feet, sometimes a bit higher, but not, not far above the summit of Everest. And the cabin is typically pressurized to about six to 8,000 feet. And so you get a sudden decompression, sudden exposure to profound hypoxia. And uh, if it were us in this room, we'd be unconscious within about 60 to 90 seconds. Uh, and because of a paradoxical ventilatory depression that occurs early, we'd be dead within about five minutes. So if there's one key take-home message. When the oxygen mass drops down, grab onto it quickly and hope that the pilot chooses to dive because the oxygen will run out after a while. So on one hand, we know that acute exposure to profound hypoxia is extremely harmful to humans. And on the other, we've got individuals who successfully climbed Everest given sufficient time to adapt without the use of supplemental oxygen, so just breathing ambient air. And as you know, there's a whole set of processes called acclimatization or acclimation, which allow them to do that. And they've always been described as being around factors that improve the transport of oxygen from the inspired that you breathe in down towards the tissues. And as we've touched on several times today, that's all true. All the data that came to that understanding is entirely accurate, but it's not an adequate explanation of why people adapt. And the reason we say that is because you can't predict who's going to do well or who's going to do badly. And there, there is a really profound difference between individuals who thrive at altitude and those that don't. So the Mesners who get to the summit without supplemental oxygen and others who don't even get to base camp 4,000 meters lower. You can't predict from any of these variables, and you can't predict from integrated variables, so something like VO2 max, you heard in Denny's talk today, that is not predictive of performance altitude, which is very counterintuitive. You'd expect that the capacity to shift a lot of oxygen would allow you to perform well in hypoxia, and it's simply not true. And we've seen that Mesmer and Habler were notable for 
how normal their physiology was. So very well studied and nothing about them in terms of getting oxygen, convective oxygen delivery down to the tissues was abnormal. And even more surprising that in well-adapted individuals, the oxygen content is very well maintained, indeed often super normal, and yet they're still substantially impaired. So a third of their VO2 max and capacity to do external work lost at base camp, more than a half lost by the time they get up to the South Coal. So something else is going on. And we were very focused on understanding what, for reasons I'll come on to in a moment, and our belief based on this notion that convective oxygen delivery doesn't explain things was that it would be something at a tissue level, so probably either the microcirculation or some cellular energetic function, and the mitochondria was top of the list of possible candidates there. So Cordwell Extreme Everest was established. It was actually established as a stream Everest, and the, the story as to why it became Cordwell is a relatively long one, but essentially relates to the fact that John Cordwell was kind enough to donate us half a million pounds, and that was the difference between go and no-go for us. And we set out to do research on Everest for two reasons. One I've touched on already, which is this notion that we didn't fully understand what was involved in hypoxic adaptation. And the second, and potentially more contentious, is that we really believed that we could learn about our patients, particularly critically ill hypoxic patients, from studying healthy humans ascending to altitude. And I've shown this picture before today as an example of someone who's critically ill. It's particularly poignant for several of us in the room because David, who is in fine shape now, so it's not a sad story, but David was a good friend of many of us, is a good friend of many of us, and um, so I spent my 40th birthday climbing with David. He was in great shape. It poured with rain, which was a bit of a shame. And three months later, he was in an absolutely terrible shape, and it took him several years to recover due to acute pancreatitis and the ravages of critical illness. As I've mentioned already and was touched on by Kay, we did have some clues in the genetics that there were factors that pertained relating to your ability to thrive at altitude and the ability of patients to withstand critical illnesses, and in particular ARDS, which is, is I guess, our archetypal hypoxic critical illness. I'm going to touch, as I go through, on some issues of kind of how we did this and specifically on issues of leadership. I have a very simplistic view of the elements of leadership anyway, which is you need to have a shared view of where you want to go. You need to have the vision. You need to take everyone with you. So you need to persuade those people who are on your own team and others more broadly that that's a, a worthy vision and one worth pursuing. And then you've got to do the operational piece and actually deliver to that vision. And, and of course, it's never that simple. Each of these interacts with each other as you go along. I think we were very, very lucky early on. And I, I love this quote. It's a T. Lawrence quote. So T. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, probably most well known from the David Lean film, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, but also a very famous book written in the 1920s. And there's this wonderful quote in the very first pages about those who dream by night and whose dreams don't come to pass, and those who dream during the day, which he talked of as the dangerous men, for they dream with their eyes open and their dreams are possible. And I think one of the great advantages and joys of the Extreme Everest Project was that there were a, a whole group of us who shared a vision and a dream and were lucky enough to be able to follow that dream through. And our ambition from the very start was to try and improve the care of our patients. So most of the team were involved in the care of sick patients as anesthesiologists, critical care doctors, critical care nurses, surgeons, biomedical scientists. And this was, from the beginning, a shared aim. And more specifically, based on what I've told you already, we had some key things we wanted to do. We wanted to make these extraordinary measurements that we were lucky enough to make at extreme altitude, but probably most importantly, to study a large number of people so we could look at the variability. And the variability is the real meat of the science because it allows us to look at, so those that adapt well, those that adapt badly, and try and understand how it is that that happens and why it is that happens. And, and then hopefully from that, look at developing no novel interventions that can essentially mimic that beneficial adaptation. It was a long and complex road. So we probably first came up with the notion of this in about 2000, 2001, and it was typically rolled out in the, the pub sort of halfway through the evening and then talked about and then nothing happened. And after a while, we got a bit bored of repeatedly talking about it, not doing anything about it, and had a, a kind of put-up or shut-up moment and decided rough, I guess, late 2003, early 2004, that we should try and do this. In the spring of 2004, we went to the World Congress of Anesthesia in Paris on study leave. I think it's probably safe to declare this now. We didn't go to any of the presentations, but actually spent a very productive period of time with a group of people who came up with the bones of the plan that we eventually followed. And it involved a huge amount of preparation. 
So you've seen in different presentations today some of the validation and reliability work we did around the devices for measurement. So we were able to go to Everest with a very high degree of confidence that we would be able to measure the physiological variables we wanted to measure and we would be able to measure them accurately. The whole trip would not be in vain. And we were also able to go in the confidence that we had a team of folk who could deliver the job. We sent two expeditions, or we went on two expeditions, to this mountain, which is Choyoyu. It's the sixth highest mountain in the world. It's 8,201 metres. It's only about 10 miles away from Everest. And it's a relatively straightforward climb for an 8,000 metre peak. And we were able to test the individuals and know who was going to be able to perform well, not get altitude illness, and be able to conduct these experiments at extreme altitude. So... Said simply, it can sometimes seem like quite a reckless plan. In fact, there was a huge amount of investment in having a, as best a degree of confidence that we could that we'd be able to deliver it. It was hugely logistically complex. We had a team of five individuals whose entire focus was on sorting out the logistics. There were half a million, it's still a big number, but half a million items uh, that were sent off in these. We had 400 of these blue plastic bags, which are the standard sort of porter currency in Nepal. We had more than 100 cylinders of different types of gas for calibration or medical purposes. And these were all shipped out from the UK originally, so about 26 metric tonnes of air freight, and then carried up, initially flown, some flown, some driven, and then carried on on somebody or something, as in an animal, above 2,800 metres. So there's no motorised transport. It's all on yaks or mules or, or often on local porters. It's a huge amount of kit transported to the various labs including them by the Sherpas to the laboratories higher on the mountain and our logistics team did a perfect job we never could not find anything which many of us reflect somewhat ironically on when we're functioning in the NHS and it's not quite like that and we were able to continue even under circumstances where sometimes we had a bike breakdown in camp two it was the spare part was up at camp two by the following morning and it was fixed before we started testing it was logistically complicated in terms of people the disposition of people again although expeditions can sound quite adventurous we knew pretty much where everybody was going to be from well before we left and this spreadsheet describes day by day columns are individuals where they would be and then the, the blue columns are different teams over the course of the three months of the expedition and the orange sort of slanting row of columns over there are the different groups of healthy volunteers ascending at the same rate, really key to the experimental design. So they all ascend over the same time frame. So the exposure to hypoxia is very consistent. And the, diff- the physiology, physiological differences we see reflect their innate characteristics as opposed to their ascent profile. The engagement piece was very important, and one of the most important things, we, we didn't seem to have much problem engaging people to join our team. There were a lot of people who were passionate about, a lot of physicians and other healthcare workers who were passionate about delivering the goal, but we also needed a lot of money to do the expedition, and it wasn't something that was likely to be funded by the conventional big grant givers. So we got into the whole area of public relations, which is pretty unfamiliar ground for physicians, and we were, with a lot of help from our friends, we were reasonably successful in getting good PR across a whole range of media, and ultimately that led to the funding through a variety of sources, most of which were either philanthropic or unrestricted commercial funding. So typically someone in a company who just had really got a passion for the idea and then committed some funding for the research, and for that we're hugely grateful. And we also worked very hard on communication within the team, Uh, So this is some of the group that flew out in late March 2007. Several faces in the room, you may not recognise them, they look a lot younger in this photograph, but we won't go into that in too much detail. But we were very rigorous about our ongoing communication during the expedition so that everybody knew what everyone else was doing and and if we were going off-piste in terms of the pre-arranged plan, we were very clear as to why that was happening. So there were daily briefings at every single place, every laboratory or every camp power on a mountain, We had daily satellite phone calls between base camp as the hub and all the spokes in the different labs, both below and above. And I think that was very important for maintaining the shared vision of the team because it gets pretty grueling living at base camp or Nampshi or Ferrishay for two or three months and for keeping everybody focused on the goal but also managing expectations about whether we were going to be able to climb next week or a bit later than that. And I think that was a very valuable component. I won't get this into detail. This was the the design. So we had a large group of trekkers, uh, healthy volunteers drawn from the general public. As Monty commented, incredibly kind in that they gave up their holidays, they gave up their money to pay for it. Uh, They donated in addition to the science. And and then uh, on top of all that, they hopped on off exercise bikes and had blood tests and all sorts of things. And we really couldn't have done this without them. This was our laboratory environment. So baseline testing in London. 
some tests in Kathmandu, fly up to Lukla, and then Namshi Bazaar, which is the Sherpa capital you can see just down at the bottom of this image, and then trekking up through to Everest Base Camp. And this is the ascent profile. That, again, I won't cover that in detail. You're on commercial jetliner to Kathmandu, which is a relatively safe airport, although not with the best safety record. And from there, typically twin otters or other sort of small twin-engined prop planes up to the airstrip in the mountains called Lukla, which is uh, well recognised as the most dangerous airport in the world. I know this from a, an evening just after our second child arrived, New Year's Eve, in fact, when Denny was fast asleep, understandably, uh, and I was channel hopping and, and up came the 10 most dangerous airports in the world, and lo and behold, Lukla was at number one. There's a, essentially a, a very steep cliff at the far end of the runway as we're looking at it, and a steep cliff upwards behind the photographer, so there's very little tolerance for error. And our trekkers would talk about this as one of their greatest concerns of the whole trip. Even right up at base camp, they'd still be ruminating about the flight out of, uh, of Lukla. This is the geography. So you can see the Kumbu Valley in green going up, and then the overnight stops in blue, the laboratories in red right up to Everest Base Camp, and just above the ST of Everest Base Camp, the summit of Everest. The trek starts low and green and relatively lush, all on somebody or some animal's feet and progressively gets a little bit more austere. You go through uh, the top two photographs of the laboratory at Namshi Bazaar, where there's a reasonable sized settlement. The bottom photograph is Ferrishe, which is one of the higher permanent settlements, or probably the highest permanent settlements. Above there, it's, it's seasonal, which is a pretty cold, uh, austere place. And then above that, you start to get onto glacial moraine and then up to Everest Base Camp. So you can see in the foreground the two science tents, and in the background our logistics and medical tent. And inside, we can do just about anything that was possible uh, at, in our labs at sea level. So we're on normal for UK 240-volt AC electricity. We've got generators, reasonably fancy electrical setup, solar panels. We've got functioning cardiopulmonary exercise testing, cardiac output monitoring, blood gas machines, the whole lot. And on the trekkers, we were as kind as we could be. And the most invasive we got to was venous blood sampling. On the investigators, we had all sorts of mischief, including gastrointestinal tonometry, which got an honourable mention earlier on. We had arterial lines, we had muscle biopsies, and one of my worst days up there is this one, where, so two arterial lines, one for the sampling, but that interrupted the monitoring on the first one, so we had to put a second one in to do the, the monitoring, and that wasn't a great day at the office. It wasn't all bad. This is an image of the puja, which is the welcoming ceremony that the Sherpas have when you get to base camp. Very, very important to the very spiritual people, very important to bless the expedition. And the blessing involves initially some religious incantation, and then some singing and dancing and Nepalese homebrewed beer, and then everything you might expect that would follow from that. It started about 10 o'clock in the morning, so by just after lunch, most people were a little bit fatigued. And so we went back to the big mess tent and watched a movie. And I can tell you this is not the day of the puja, because on the day of the puja, I don't know what possessed us, but we watched Love Actually, and I do remember sitting at the front and turning around and seeing an entire mess tent, maybe 50, 60 people without a single dry eye in the house across all these burly mountaineers and Sherpas. Anyway, and these are our trekkers. Already acknowledged the huge contribution they gave. Uh, again, just to highlight, the, the bottles of wine on the table mean that this must be the last night. So they, they were very well behaved, uh, contributed to all our testing and then the last night they had this custom of singing the song that they'd created on the way up and we gave them some wine as a fairly pitiful reward for all that they'd put in and as a consequence of all that we had if you'll excuse the pun literally mountains of data so more than 13 person years from this expedition alone by the time we've done extreme everest two more than 25 person years of daily physiological data, nearly 2,000 exercise tests, more than 10,000 blood tests. And that's why we all look at, apart from the passage of time, the grey hair relates to trying to mow through this enormous data set. I'm going to be light on the science, but just emphasise the key points. Uh, consistent with what I've told you already and what you've heard today, there was no relationship at all between the change in oxygen content, or oxygen delivery indeed, and the change in oxygen consumption. So very counterintuitive. We have this delightful phenomenon whereby those that are fittest lose the largest amount, not just in absolute terms, but proportionately. And this completely fits with the anecdotes you get from the guides on Everest. You take people up every year and they have their two stereotypes of the, on one hand, the racing snake. So the typical the stereotype would be a type A triathlete businessman from New York, super skinny, turns up, expects to get to the top and struggles. And then type B is the kind of the Midwest self-made, slightly overweight businessman who might smoke a little bit and drinks a little too much, 
who potters up to base camp, potters up to top, potters down again and can't work out what all the fuss is about. And, and they really do describe those stereotypes. Why is that? Well, we were first, through Dan Martin's work, to show that actually the microcirculation is fundamentally changed. So one of the things that's going on is that your auto-regulation, if you like, so the matching of need with supply is messed up when lowlanders adapt to high altitude. And as I mentioned, we also wanted to look at metabolism, so we had to get muscle biopsies. I suspect Chris hates this joke. It's one of my favourite images of the whole, the whole expedition. So the lady sitting down is Denny, who you've heard from today, anaesthesiologist, and the chap lying down is Chris. So anaesthesiologist taking chunks of meat out of surgeon. Some people in the room may appreciate it. <laughs> we got some great samples. This is one of the early photomicrographs. Came back from our colleagues in Switzerland with a great little commentary from Hans Hoppler. He said, this is a very well-preserved sample because we wanted to be confident that the quality control had been good. It's a deeply deconditioned individual, which I found a little disappointing because we sent my sample as the, the test sample. From that, we were able to infer, but not be sure, through Andrew Murray's work, that there were changes in mitochondrial function. So we had changes in protein levels and changes in biogenesis factors, but couldn't actually measure function back in 2013. From 2007, we were left with a number of unanswered questions. So what about the Sherpas? It was probably the most frequently asked question as we went around talking to folk and it had bothered us, but when we first set up the expedition in 2007, we felt the ethical problems of recruiting individuals who probably didn't understand the science we were doing were too much. As it turned out, the group that we took with us in 2005, 6 and 7 completely got what we were doing. They were interested in it, they became engaged in it, and we were able to work with them and their relatives to do the testing in 2013. And you've seen these images before, convincingly showed that Sherpas are quite different from us. They're so different that you might wonder whether actually they're better at altitude and their dysfunction occurs when they come down rather than the converse. So their function is at least as good when they go up as it is when they're down at Kathmandu. And you can see a lowlander versus a Sherpa microcirculation here. Metabolic data mirrors that. So this is a sample of the extraordinary data that Andrew showed. So they are energetically more efficient under conditions of hypoxia. They've got better phosphocreatine reserves. They've got more ATP and they've got much greater control over their oxidative stress, so much less release of reactive oxygen species. And this is, I think, the last science slide, but is really to reflect where we're now going with very complex evaluation of data in a way that we couldn't really have anticipated back in 2005 or 2006. So using techniques, so the metabolomic screens we're using, we're working with the guys who did the drug screening for the Olympics in 2012, which became our National Metabolomic Centre, producing readouts on 2,000 analytes per blood sample of different metabolic mediators. So I'm going to move on to higher on the mountain. This is a map of, you can see base camp, camp one, camp two, camp three, SC is the south col, and then the route doubles back from the south col along the southeast ridge to the summit of Everest. And this is what it looks like in a picture. We had permanent camps that were laboratories at camp two, and the camp and the south column we had sort of overnight stops at camp one and camp three and we made our highest measurements at the balcony up just a few hundred meters below the summit this is the ice fall arguably one of the two most dangerous sections of the mountain along with the summit ridge where you worry about congestion in the ice fall you worry about the physical risk of things falling on you so this huge block here uh, is hopefully stable because there's a couple of climbers you can just hopefully make out there and this mess here is one of those blocks that's fallen over uh, in the previous day or two. So we went through the ice fall as quickly as possible, as early as possible to avoid the sun melting, and as few times as possible. And that really reflected our priorities. We were very clear from the beginning, safety had to be first. There's no point in going to Everest to do a medical research expedition to benefit or try to benefit patients and harm people in the process, and then science, and then summit only so much as it served the goals of science. And again, coming back to the sort of leadership management piece, we really tried hard to avoid decision making. So it's not a tale of kind of valiant decision making under difficult conditions. Almost everything was tightly matched to a plan that we'd made months before we left. We had predefined contingency responses. And to allow for the fact, we talked today about the fact that judgment may be impaired at high altitude. We had a buddy and a phone a friend policy. So if, you, if things were going badly, you phone someone at base camp who hopefully had a bit more oxygen on board and was able to make a, a more rational decision. 
This is, again, going through the ice fall. There's fixed rope the whole way up the mountain. So technically, it's not a great climbing challenge. And that's the pretty unique phenomenon on mountains. And then there's these unique, in climbing terms, these ladder bridges that you have to get across. This is Denny going across one of them. We really didn't like going across them. The views are somewhat intimidating. Our camera team's delighted in going backwards and forwards and taking pictures. This is above the ice fall, early one morning, so it's not the end of the day. It's having climbed up during the night and very early hours. And this is, again, just higher than that, just above Camp 1. And you might just be able to spot their slightly worrying sign up in the top right, which then continues to come tumbling down. You can see a slightly nervous individual in the foreground. When the dust settles, I will show you an even more nervous individual or two individuals who were right in the foreground. Thankfully, nobody was hurt by all of that. So above Camp 1, we had Camp 2. We're still on essentially mains-type electricity, still doing lots of complex physiology. Another one of those exercise tests, the beginning of an exercise test with oxygen saturations of 62 at the beginning. And then above Camp 2, the steep Lotsey face you can see in the background, and then Camp 3, the South Coal, and the balcony again. This is what the Lotsey face looks like. You can't make out. Camp 3 is just there although there's quite a few tents there it's essentially invisible because of the scale uh, again fixed ropes all the way up the Lotsey face and as an aside if you haven't seen this movie I strongly recommend it because I think it's about as close as you're ever going to get to a very accurate portrayal of what it's like to climb Everest I watched it on an aeroplane which is not untypical for me but it was very moving because it really does reflect what it's like and it's the story of the 1996 uh, disaster when a number of people died L- lots of you probably have read come across this book if you've read that book i recommend this book because it's written by the the villain of into thin air uh, who actually is probably the hero of the piece but that that is an aside so higher up steeper on the lotsey face now above camp three heading for the south coal this is the so-called yellow band you can kind of see why with fixed ropes going over the, the technically difficult pieces and at this point we're climbing on supplemental oxygen Because of the priorities of Safety Science Summit, we took the view that we would climb above Camp 3 on supplemental oxygen because the mortality rate on 8,000 metre peaks is roughly halved for those using supplemental oxygen compared with those not. It it may or may not have altered the trajectory of some of the acclimatisation, but we took all the measurements off oxygen, so people were off oxygen for at least 20 to 30 minutes, and hoped that it hadn't interfered with the measurements, but accepted the safety as a priority. This is Camp 4. We did exercise tests up here, transclonial Doppler you saw earlier this afternoon. We're now down on lightweight car batteries, but still able to do a huge number of different measurements. And this is a slide for Dan. So Dan, amongst his other roles, was named the oxygen delivery lead. So we divided the different groups up into oxygen delivery, oxygen consumption, all the rest of it. And Dan's mum, who's a lovely lady who I know quite well, took that to mean that Dan was responsible for delivering the oxygen. And that would be a really hard job, getting all this oxygen up to South Col. Which brings me back to Usha. Usha Bistri, if you remember, the lady I mentioned at the beginning, and a little more video clip uh, of what happened next. The radio link is beginning to falter. Mike uses the summit team's cameras to relay a message to base camp. Um, Okay, so the key things are cerebral edema, mild hypothermia, frostbite 10 digits, she needs dexamethasone, high flow oxygen, passive rewarming and get her to base camp as fast as possible. It may be that Camp 2 is the safest place overnight. You got all that. Most severe is cerebral edema, a swelling of the brain brought on by the high altitude. Drugs and oxygen can help, but unless she is taken to a lower altitude immediately, she is likely to die. She needs a doctor to go down with her. We've just got here, but uh, we're just going to turn her on and go back down to Camp 3 with her. It's, it's the right thing to do, you know? Bottom day. Andre volunteers to turn around and attempt the treacherous descent of the Lhotse face. No one will... Pick this one here. No hand warmers. Not hand warmers. There's not enough people here that are in good enough shape to take it on in a stretcher to rescue someone in a stretcher ideally you need 16 people we're going to try and do it with seven because we think she's got a chance the rescue party are set to go when news breaks of further casualties mike yeah there's four people in worse shape coming down who 
Mike is faced with an agonising choice. Yeah. So it's a question of which people are most salvageable. Well, she is definitely salvageable. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're still up high. Up. There's no telling. They're, 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 they're up high. We're going to get them out of here today. And there's nobody going back up to get them. It's just yeah. It's, so one one who's up there. I mean, you know, this is these are not nice decisions. If one person is up there and they're close to death and nobody's rescuing them, there's they nothing get, we can do about that. What we can do is well, rescue her. We, 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 we can save her life. Too. We'll go we talk to her. We can save her life. So I'm going to go down with her then. Okay. Because we can save her life. Yeah. Absolutely. And those guys well, yeah. may, may not die. Okay. Oh, these guys? Yeah, these two guys. On the side of the stretcher. Yeah. Okay. It was a real reminder for us who had yet still to go farther up that this was indeed um, uh, a difficult and dangerous place and, and again another warning of not to become complacent uh, about the environment. We have two guys, these two guys for rescue. Usha is to be evacuated down one and a half thousand metres to the western Coombe, where the expedition has a support team at Camp 2. Yeah, I said they can have anything they want of ours at 2. Now, they may choose to go to one of their own camps, but... Mike radios his wife, Dr. Denny Levitt, the team's chief medical officer, to alert her to the incoming casualty. We've offered to take care of the lady on her way down, and our doctors on the South Coal have assessed her there, and at the moment, she is being transported down the Lotsey face. So, Usha came down the Lotsey face... She got to Camp 2 and then became stuck at Camp 2 for several days, where she was cared for by Denny and the rest of the team there. And she then eventually was transported down to base camp nearly a week later, flown out to Kathmandu, and at the end of all that, extraordinary, just lost the tip of one thumb. And I suspect if she'd been encountered in a frostbite experienced surgeon in the first world, wouldn't even have lost that. So, so a reasonably uh, happy ending for Usha, certainly in 2007. Here's a, another shot of the summit. So the aerial shot, the turquoise path going up the Lhotse face and then the sharp turn round up the southeast ridge. We had one more scientific goal above the South Coal, and that was to attempt to measure the level of oxygen in the arterial blood of climbers on the summit. And that was because we believed, as people have believed for a long time, that that would be very close to what is possible to be tolerated. So we know people can get up there without supplemental oxygen, but we know that under certain conditions, so bad weather, low bar barometric pressure, it, it's not possible. So it's got to be very close to the limit of what's survivable. We set off, as is common practice now, to climb during the night. So we set off about half past nine, ten o'clock in the evening, climbed for several hours during the night. Quite a strange experience. You just, you've got a head torch on, big down suit, lots of clothes, an oxygen system and a face mask. And you can just really, you can see a little bit in front of you with the head torch. You can hear a little bit of scratching from your crampons, maybe the person in front of the person behind crampons. And you occasionally come across a feature that you know roughly where you are, and then you keep going. And it wasn't until about half past five in the morning that we started to get sunlight. It became a little bit warmer. I thought it was wonderful. Dan said he thought it was terrible because he could see the way back down again. And about six o'clock, or just before six, we got to the south summit, and we got this, which is our first view of uh, both the Hillary Step and the summit behind. And then we went beyond the Hillary Step, the last few hundred metres to the summit, and I've got another short video section. If you listen, it's a noisy video. There's a lot of wind on the microphone type noise, but you can hear the ventilation of the Sherpa who is carrying the head cam, who's driving the video. He's got the helmet, which has got the head cam on it. And then you also will see an individual walking towards the camera. At sea level, they're an elite athlete, so they're a national standard competitive athlete.
So the last few incredibly slow steps up towards the summit by essentially an elite athlete. We got eight of the climbing doctors, two climbing cameramen and 15 Sherpas to the summit. We didn't get our blood gas. It was a little bit cold and a little bit windy, about minus 20 and 25 knots of wind. And I still think it was reasonably prudent to not get the gas there. We got some amazing views. So you can see Makalu in the foreground, fifth highest mountain in the world. The peak in the background is Kanchen Jungle, which is the third highest mountain in the world. It's about 150 miles away. And we descended about 400 meters to this shelter and there took four arterial blood gases, which the Sherpa Passang rang down to the benchtop blood gas analyzer at Camp 2 and Denny and friends analyzed it there. And we got these extraordinary results. So PAO2s from me, Dan, Chris, who's sitting over there, and Sandeep, who's uh, back in England at the moment. Dan's being the most extraordinary at just over 19 millimeters of mercury in the face of essentially normal function. And we've talked already about how unusual those figures are, very unusual even if you look across the whole animal kingdom. And yes, this extraordinary phenomenon that we have all experienced them as a fetus in utero and and happily thrived. And and the belief that gives us that we will be able to identify mechanisms that are beneficial because they've all been in play at some point during our existence. I'm going to close with a couple of images. Uh, This is one of uh, my favourites. It's the first image we took when we all came back down from the summit And mixed in there are a bunch of the medical team, some of the climbing, some of the non-climbing physicians on the mountain, the camera team, a bunch of Sherpas, and you can't really tell who's who. For me, it exemplifies the team effort that was getting up and getting down the mountain safely. Uh, The second image is a little bit self-indulgent. It's uh, so Denny and I and our three children in Kathmandu, we went back. Dan led Extreme Everest 2, the big Sherpa study. We, because of the young kids, stayed in Kathmandu, and in our view, it was roughly equivalently challenging having three months in Kathmandu with three kids trying to run a lab as, as climbing the mountain and leading an expedition. And then this is Usha again. And this ended up being a happy story. I got an email in my inbox late May 2008. Dear Mike, hope you are well. Have just come back from summiting Everest. So she didn't learn, but it sounds like it was a good thing she didn't. Before I close, I'm going to do one additional thing, which is to ask those folk who were with me, because it was a big team effort, to stand up and share either the boos or the applause. So the people who were with us on 2007-2013, please. Brilliant. Thank you very much for listening. Top Don't forget you can meet the Top Med Talk team at pom.org forward slash meetings. Our next big event takes place between the 28th and the 30th of September. Ebpom USA Chicago Masters course, a perioperative care practicum.